somewhat of what you alluded to, but it's the response of believers. And there's this idea, I think, that like Jesus is unable to handle the mockery because they mocked him. They, they are now the enemy. And I think when you see Jesus' posture on the cross, when he says, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Forgive them if they understood the magnitude of this. It would help us better understand that those people are not the enemy of Christ. Those people are the prize of Christ. And in their current condition, yeah, they're separated from him. But in our current condition, before we come to Jesus, we're all separated from him. And I think he wants the drag queen as much as he wants the person who grew up in the Bible Belt. He, he desires to be in relationship with them. And I think sometimes when we get so heated about some of these things, what it does is it causes us to lose sight of the reality that God is absolutely capable of not only defending himself, but going and getting the people who have offended him. Welcome to Let's Talk About That, the podcast where we take a deeper dive into Sunday's message and explore any questions you might have. I'm your host, AJ Stevens, joined by lead pastor, Chip Parker, and I'm thrilled to be on this journey with you. Whether you're a longtime member of The Orchard or a first-time visitor, Let's Talk About That is your space to explore, reflect, and connect. Join us as we navigate the intricacies of faith, spirituality, and daily life, seeking to understand how the wisdom shared on Sundays can be applied to our modern challenges. So grab a cup of coffee, find a comfortable space, and let's dive in together. This is Let's Talk About That, where the conversation about Sunday's message never stops. All right, we are back, and by we are back, I mean, Chip, you and I are back at the same time. And it's been a minute. It has been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to be back, though. I was able to listen to the stories we had with uh, the Burks yeah. and uh, you and Matt, and it was good. Yeah. It was good to go through it, which, by the way, I appreciate Matt wishing me a happy birthday. Yeah, he did do that. I yeah. mentioned it, didn't I? Yeah, after he did, because <laughs> you were obligated at that point. Yeah, I was absolutely obligated. But I texted you, and I yeah. can't say that he texted you. You did. I don't know if he did or not. He did in the group text, for yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Honestly, I was turning 40. I was trying to black out yeah. most of that day. Man, and 40. I know. That's crazy. You know, so, I, I totally... No, yeah, so let me... I want to be clear. You weren't trying to black out. You were trying to black out most <laughs> of that day. Fair enough. Okay. Yes. Right. That's, so, that's, that's right. Did, you know, that's doesn't right. leave any room for the semantics. Uh, <laughs> no, it's like, you know, I've never cared about my age. Uh, and as you or Matt, one, I don't remember which one, uh, you know, aptly noted, uh, my hairstyle has beat me uh, to the middle <laughs> age by a while. But when you hit 40, like... <laughs> The term young doesn't even loosely apply to you anymore. Like you are firmly middle age in when you're at 40. And I will say, though, I feel like 40 as a as a 30 year old doesn't seem nearly as old. Oh, no, as no. 40 when I was 12. Look, you know what I mean? 65 doesn't seem nearly yeah, as old. Right. As it, you know? the, what is it? 40 is the new 20, baby. You're, well, you're fresh. The, the thing is, I just don't feel like you can. I can't, with a clear conscience, refer to myself as young in any way, shape, or form anymore. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'm sure I was able to, even in college, because I was the guy at 1201 in the dorm yelling at people to shut up and go to bed. Gosh, so, man, fun sucker. We should have been roommates, Chip. I had a roommate like you, actually. His name was, was his Mike name Matt Pennington? Nope. Oh. His name was Mike Stafford, and Mike Stafford wore the old man in the house badge proudly, and he was in bed by 10, and if we were loud playing FIFA or anything, doing anything, rock man, what didn't matter. If we were loud and it was after 10 o'clock, Mike was going to come out of his room and he was going to tell us, guys, I'm trying to sleep. I have an 8 a.m. class. You need to either turn it down or go to bed. I but respect I the heck out of that. And, uh, we and would by res- the way, FIFA? Yeah. FIFA? We, we, we were in a FIFA season in college. Look, yeah. FIFA we played a was lot. electric. It was. We played a lot of FIFA. Yeah. But um, we respected Mike and we told Mike that we would. And then usually a week later, we did the exact same thing. And so it's just this recurring nightmare where Mike had to come out of his room and tell us to be quiet. It's phenomenal. <laughs> So, yeah, I get that. I get that. So, what did you do for your 40th birthday? Did you do anything exciting, man? Um, you know, uh, not a, a ton. I, I woke up and played pickleball and beat up on some people who also couldn't be called young. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, 70s. And yeah. I was fine with that. Maybe 60s. I don't know. Uh, and then uh, went and ate uh, dinner, you know, with the family that day. My my lovely bride took me... Uh, Took me shopping uh, because she's on uh, th- this mission to make my closet more accurately reflect my age. Mm-hmm. Because again, even though I'm just now turning forty, my closet has looked mid fifties for a while. Why do you? Oh, okay. So she. Wa- okay. All right. All right. So I was thinking she wants your closet to get a little older. Oh no. But you're saying she wants no. your closet to get a little younger. No, I kept trying to buy polos, and she was like, "No, stop." Mm. <laughs> 
Mm. <laughs> okay. All right. So what does that look like? What does a 40 year old closet look like? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Oh, you haven't done it yet? No. Oh, okay. I mean, right. we're piecing it together. As you see, gotcha. today I'm, I'm wearing a polo that there I got go. from Sam's Club. The, the rope hat is a staple right now. I love that. Okay. So I am, I am in, I'm in on the hats. Yeah. Though. In yeah. on the hats. Yeah. And we've talked about that here on the podcast. So yeah. totally in on the hats. Love it. And uh, yeah, just kind of chilled out. Uh, we were at the at the beach over in Mexico Beach where my dad lives and spent the week over there on vacation and it was great. You know, it was a good, good time. I didn't have to be on the beach long, so it was great. That's good, man. I'm glad you got a little R and R. I think uh, sometimes people give you the tongue in cheek little jibe oh, yeah. here oh, for yeah. taking a break, and uh, man, especially doing what you do, I I think you need a break. Well, yeah. So. Let, let me just you know, number one, say I, I really am thankful and blessed to work in a place at a church that really allows for that because mm-hmm. I know. You know, you missed two Sundays back to back at a lot of churches. You know they're they're having a vote on whether you're going to still be employed. Right. Um, but I feel like the orchard has always uh, not anything to do with me as lead pastor. Back when Eddie and Michael started the church, like the orchard has always, you know, encouraged the staff to use their vacation days to take time off. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, again, I'm blessed that the church, uh, you guys as staff, are able to keep things going, and the church, you know, is encouraging of me to take more than one week off in a row. Yeah. And that's something that Eddie had told me for years as my mentor before I came to the orchard. Um, take two weeks back to back. And I never could do it. Yeah. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Even when um, we moved here and Leanne started working for the daycare, we couldn't really do it then because even though I might be able to mi- miss two weeks, she couldn't because mm-hmm. she just needed to be here to run things. Well, starting last summer, we were able to do that because she was no longer working at the daycare. This year, she was in the classroom, so she's off the summer. So the past two summers, we've been able to take two weeks back to back. And I'm going to tell you, if you have that uh, opportunity, and I know not everybody does, if you have that opportunity, do it. Yeah. Because you don't realize how much that first week of vacation, Mm -hmm. you're unwinding, you're getting there, you're whatever. And then, you know, if you're like me, I'm ramping back up. You know, by by the last by the Wednesday Thursday before we were done, I was already ramping back up and took you know taking a couple hours a day to work. You know, yeah. um, but it's cool because uh, if you know me, I don't sleep well or I sleep a lot. Like I, I like to get up and, and get to the office and everything. But I slept the latest that I have slept in forever the second week on vacation. Good, uh, slept awesome. till eight o'clock Central Time. Wow, two days in a row. That's good. That never happens. That's awesome. Me. But I think it shows that, you know, sometimes when we're go, 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 it takes our bodies yeah. longer to let go than we realize. Yeah. And I think that's why rest is important. And again, you know, Eddie told me this a long time ago, and I'm just now really beginning to see the value of it. If you have that opportunity, I know not everybody does. Yeah. If you have that opportunity, man, it's well worth it because you really, the, the second week was rest. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think, uh, your your body's constantly harboring what your brain is is navigating, and so it's if your brain isn't shut off, your body's not going to shut off. It is know? true, and I don't, you know, I, I've said this before. I don't mind the nature of what I do. I love the nature of what I do. I, it doesn't bother me at all if I'm answering texts in the evenings or right. you know working on my iPad at night or early in the morning or getting texts on the weekend. Like, that doesn't bother me at all, mm-hmm. but. Sometimes I don't realize, like you said, if you're always in that state, you're always in that state. And it may not be bothering you, but it does cost something. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then just to kind of realize, oh, OK, I can sleep that long. I just never do because that's not how my brain works. So yeah. anyway, it, it was well, good. good. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed I'm it. glad you're refreshed. I'm glad you're back. And now that you're back into the real world with us, well, you missed you missed a lot um, as far as like global things go because. Oh, yeah. We were out of the country. We were, yeah. I think I mentioned on here, we, we found a group on to Jamaica yeah. that we went with some friends. A text in Jamaica from you. Yeah. Dude, I think Trump just got shot. Yeah. What? Yeah. Am I going to be able to go back into the country? Yeah. What just happened? And then when you find out what happened, it's still like, look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'll leave that to you guys. One of my hobbies Come is on. debunking conspiracy <laughs> theories. Yeah. But that was weird. Yeah. That was weird. That whole thing is weird. They're, somebody screwed up royally. I'll just say that. Yeah. Or they didn't screw up, and the screw up happened when they missed. That's the conspiracy theory that's going around. Right I know. Now. I know. Like, there's a bunch. Wild, there's a bunch. So. And I don't even try to debunk these conspiracy yeah, theories. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's, it was a weird, weird thing. And it's way too fresh, and there's too many opinions out there, so there's no oh, reason to die. Yeah. Do it. But, but um, you know, there's that, and then there's- But one thing. Yeah, go ahead. That we were in Jamaica, and we're seeing the pictures, you know, slowly post. 
and the picture with Trump surrounded by Secret Service, blood on his face, fist, fist in the air, yeah. American flag behind him. Yeah. Uh, buddy I was with, we said, look, no matter what you think about Trump, no matter if you vote for Trump, no matter if he wins the election or not, that picture is going down in history. Yeah. That yeah. picture is going down in history. One of the most iconic photos I've seen in my lifetime. Yeah. That one. That's and, right up there with some of those 9-11 pictures that are yeah. just iconic. Iconic. Yeah. Not comparing the two events, if you're sensitive about that. Right. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying when you see a picture and you know, wow. Yeah. That's that's a picture that's going to live for a long time. So for me, the iconic uh, picture, I guess, from that moment was not necessary. And that, that is iconic, but that wasn't the one that stuck out to me. I guess the, the artist in me, the photographer in me. The one where he's on the ground and there's oh, like yeah, blood yeah. dripping off his face. And the reason that one was like, so I was like, wow, like there's a photographer out there who in the middle of the chaos decided not to duck and cover. But while it's still fresh and he's still like ducking down, decided to pick up their camera and do their job. Like that's to me, like the, the, the career side of that, the artistic side of that, that, that was probably not that it should be a favorite photo. That was the most impressive photo. Of the bunch to yeah, me. So what's interesting to me, just from a cultural standpoint, this is the first time something like that has happened in our country. Um, not that a, a candidate or a president or whatever was you know, shot at. That's happened several times. Uh, but this is the first time it's happened really in the cell phone era. Mm. And to see all the different pictures, angles, videos, it yeah. was just, it was totally different. Yeah. Like I remember when I was growing up and uh, Reagan got shot. Mm -hmm. Well, there were news footage of it because news cameras were there because he's the president. But that was it. There was no cell phones, you right. know. Um, so it was just crazy to see the, the cultural implications of what uh, an event like that looks like in a cell phone era which Crazy. is either going to help debunk the conspiracy theories or give more weight to them because now it's not just the news outlet that's got it chip it's everybody so yeah. just interesting thought but yeah i agree so that's that's happening and and you get back and you you're you know, obviously all that's happened while you're away and then the other thing as soon as you get back that's happening globally is you have the olympics are happening and oh but are the olympics happen did they have an open yeah. ceremonies i've not <laughs> seen crazy. anything about the opening <laughs> ceremonies on my facebook and here here's what's here's what's crazy about this for me right you have the last couple of olympics to me it seemed like there was a lot of division amongst our athletes country whatever this olympics okay. it seems to me that there's a a big amount of unity that's happening um and like athletes are so they're not bashing the country they're playing for they're excited about it. i haven't seen a lot of that in the news and twitter and x or whatever um but then it doesn't just stay there then you have this opening ceremony and um as that stuff starts to unfold and we don't just live in the cell phone era we live in the social media era yeah. too and those yeah. two things are tied together but you start to see it and you start to i think a when you see that kind of stuff you start to formulate your own opinion and then you go on social media and you see oh either there's more people on this side of the coin, so maybe I should have that opinion, or maybe there's less people on that side, so I'm going to have that opinion, or, or whatever. And, and those opinions that you can have at your fingertips in seconds start to help influence or maybe sway your opinion. Um, and, and I think that just happens a lot in our culture, and so yeah. that's why this ceremony blew up. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So the I ceremony. didn't watch the ceremony live. Um, matter of fact, when we were on vacation, we were trying to figure out what day the Olympics started. <laughs> Just like, I don't even know what it starts. But the first thing, when I went back and watched some of the opening ceremonies, Number one, why are we not talking more about these people on these gigantic poles that were just flopping back and forth? There, yeah. Did you see that? No. That, it was wild. It was, it was crazy. Just like, how, how big are we talking here? Like, way up in the air on these flexible poles, and they were just like swaying back. It, it was weird. Okay? Be me. Uh, number two, the whole opening ceremony was weird, but, you know, artistic, whatever, I guess. Um, the first thing I saw, though, was the threesome conversation, right? Did you see that? No. Really? Yeah. So in the opening ceremony, there's like a cut up of clips of three people. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, share some of my biases and maybe even ignorance. One appeared to identify as a woman. One appeared to identify as a man. And the other, if I had to guess, was a little more fluid than that. Okay. And they meet in the library and they start flirting back and forth with the titles of books and whatnot. And eventually it ends with them all chasing uh, each other and ending up in a room where they're obviously showing affection, you know, and then the guy kind of wags his finger, no, no, and shuts the door. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they showed that. Matter of fact, there was a TikTok I watched 
where mom was talking about watching that with her kids, and she goes uh, that as soon as it's over, and they're, they're not they were a religious family. As soon as it was over, the kid goes, "All three of them, really? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was like it was like pretty blatant." But then even that got overshadowed by yeah. the uh, apparent mockery of the Last Supper, mm-hmm. and there has been a, a ton of takes on that. But if you haven't seen it, I'm sure you have. There was a stage, some have said a runway, others have said a table, Mm -hmm. uh, with a plus-size model and some drag queens apparently recreating loosely the image of Da Vinci's Last Supper painting. Right. Right? Um, There's been a lot of heated responses on social media about that. Mm -hmm. And so let me just kind of share some thoughts on that. Number one... I've seen the argument that, oh, no, that wasn't supposed to be that Last Supper. If we were cultured and better read, we would understand that was the Feast of Dionysus, the Greek god of feasting and festival, because the blue, weird-looking guy was not a Smurf. It was actually supposed to be not a Dionysus. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did see that. That was weird. <clears throat> uh, but I'm sorry. I just can't buy yeah. that that first shot mm-hmm. of the long table runway, whatever, was not a recreation of the Last Supper. And if you just look at how they positioned their say, bodies, the angles the they poses. created, yeah. they were obvious. Whether that was the intent or not, that was obviously what those people decided to do in that moment. And the one thing that struck me is how it seems in our world today, the only group that is that it's okay to openly mock are Christians. Yeah. Like, if that had been attacking Islam, Mm. mocking Islam, there would be a massive outcry. There'd probably also be some retaliation. I don't know if you remember this, but do you remember the the French magazine? I think it was the Charlie Hebo uh, shooting Mm. where the the magazine had published a uh, illustration, like a political illustration, making fun of Muhammad and a Muslim uh, broke into the offices and, like, shot up the offices because you don't... Okay, so that's exactly what I... Yeah, I just said there's going to be some retaliation. And that was very real in the French culture. And I've seen people say, well, it's just not... Oh, I I do remember that now you say that. I I don't remember... It's not reasonable to think that a Christian nation would mock a Christian... Okay, France may be a historically Christian nation. It's not so much anymore. Um, just like America is not so much anymore a Christian nation, even though we may be historically. Yeah. I think it was obviously an open mockery of Christianity, the Last Supper. It was no accident that it was predominantly drag queens who were portraying this. Um, and it just strikes me that you attack any other group, quote unquote, of people, it's off limits, yeah. except Christians. Right. And then that's cool. However, yeah. even that open mockery, I, I think, yes, it deserves a statement from mm. Christians about, hey, we see that and we take notice of that and it's not OK to mock Jesus. But we have to be very careful, especially on social media, that we don't cross the line into just spewing hate yeah. when hate is spewed at us. Yeah. So that's there's two things that about this whole thing that really bugged me. It's disturbing as a dad. Right. Like yeah. I have my values. I keep my values in my household and, and we share a lot of those values. And I want to raise my kids according to the biblical worldview. And so when it's a mom in the living room with her son and her son goes, all three of them. Right. Like I want my kids to appreciate and enjoy the sports. I want them to watch the Olympics, but I don't want them to do that with an agenda. And I don't want them to do that. And so that's as a dad, that part of it is frustrating. Well, I get that because I'm like that as a dad as well. I just I do think, though, that you have two options. One is to retreat into your Christian bubble. Right. Separationism, isolationism um, and say, well, I'm just going to shield my kids from all of that. And no, even wrong. There's an age where kids yeah. need to be shielded uh, from different things. I don't think there's not an age where we don't need to be shielded from some things. Right. Just what those things are change a little bit. Um, but I do think that the better option instead of running away from all of that is to use discernment but expose kids to what they're going to see in culture 
and help them understand how to process and think through it biblically. Yeah. yeah. Because the truth is everybody's always going to have an agenda mm-hmm. and we're not going to be able to keep that agenda away from the next generation. We have to teach them how to engage that agenda, right. but to critique it from a biblical perspective. Yeah. So there's just, there's so it, many, it's hard. There's so many variables in that. There's the age of your kid. There's where you're at. Your kid well, is you're at. going to do that with Sawyer. Right. <laughs> and, or even Dax. And there's a, there's also the variable like, yeah, I mean, my kid may not be saved yet. And, I, and I'm like, I, I'm going to tell you how I would navigate this, but I have the Holy Spirit and you don't. And so it's just, there's some dynamics there at play that you like to be able to, and you're never always going to, you're not always going to be able to, but you like to be able to kind of shield or protect until you're ready. And this is the kind of conversation me and Matt had last week with the uh, coloring book Christianity, right? There's parts yeah, of the that's... Bible that I don't want my kids to necessarily understand or unpack in their adolescence, but that we're going to keep having the conversation about. And so I think it's also true in culture. And then the other thing uh, about this that bugged me is not necessarily just the agenda, but it's, and it's really honestly not even to do, it, it comes out of the ceremony, but the the piece of it that bugs me is somewhat what you alluded to, but it's the response of believers. And there's this idea, I think, that like Jesus is unable to handle the mockery because they mocked him. They, they are now the enemy. And I think when you see Jesus' posture on the cross, when he says, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Forgive them if they understood the magnitude of this. It would help us better understand that those people are not the enemy of Christ. Those people are the prize of Christ. And in their current condition, yeah, they're separated from him. But in our current condition, before we come to Jesus, we're all separated from him. And I think he wants the drag queen as much as he wants the person who grew up in the Bible Belt. He, He desires to be in relationship with them. And I think sometimes when we get so heated about some of these things, what it does is it causes us to lose sight of the reality that God is absolutely capable of not only defending himself, but going and getting the people who have offended him. And so for the believer who's got a social media platform, man, don't like... (laughs) People are never the enemy. The ideology is the enemy. Lost people are never the enemy. Right. Lost people are never the enemy. One more time. Lost people are never the enemy. Now, that does not mean that it's sometimes they don't have to be opposed yeah. because of the ideology they represent. doesn't mean that there's sometimes they don't need to be confronted mm-hmm. because of the ideology they represent. However, when we confront or oppose or whatever, we do so in love mm-hmm. as a posture of an ambassador of the kingdom who is not there to build a wall but to welcome people through the sheep gate. Yeah. Like that, that's the point. Yeah. And it gets me every time when we feel that outrage, when Christianity is mocked, Mm -hmm. not that there shouldn't like, like if you say something against my wife, that's going to rile up in me. My kid, that's going to rile up in me. You do that against my savior. Something's going to rile up in me. But yet Jesus told us clearly, Hey, the world hates me. They're going to hate you. Yeah. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. Matter of fact, look at, listen to what Jesus prays in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, Jesus is praying in verse 13. He says, now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. Jesus says, I'm coming back to the Father mm-hmm. and I'm praying these things in the world so they may have my joy complete in them. He goes, I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world just as not just as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Yeah. Right? So Jesus is saying, look, I know they're going to be hated. I know they're going to be mocked. And I'm not asking God in this. Father, I'm not asking you to stop that. Mm-hmm. I'm just asking that you protect them from the evil one who's behind it all. 100%. And, and I think that's where we have to be as Christians. Again, yeah. I'm not saying that we lay down and, right. and never offer that defense of our faith. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is ever okay for people to mock and have this sacrilegious imagery. However, in a social media age, we need to be clear that they are not our enemy and that they know they're not our enemy. And I think even a less spiritual, broader point beyond all that is what does it say about the world we live in when we are most outraged over something that doesn't affect us? Mm. This happened at the Olympics in France, and we will never meet those people. Yeah. Most of us will never go to that country. Mm. We're not going to be competing in France. And your day-to-day life today, while you're listening to this, has been affected a grand total of 0% by what just happened. 
And so in a social media age, we're so outraged by stuff that really has no immediate impact on our life. Yeah. And that's why I think it's easy for us to see these people who in our minds exist just on the internet as our enemy. When if we knew them as a person, we might disagree with them, but we never treat them that way. Yeah. And, and so I think that we just have to be careful to let's not let our days, our emotions, our reactions be so consumed by things that really at the end of the day don't impact us. Let, let's let's be, you say this all the time, AJ, let's be where our body is. Mm-hmm. Let, let's be in our communities. Let's be in our schools. Let's be with our family. Let's pour into those. Let's focus on those instead of being outraged by something that happened thousands of miles away that is going to be debated on news ra- on news you know shows and, and not okay there's a single mom down the road who's struggling with three kids and she could use some help yeah and the and on the same side of that coin the gospel's already offensive the gospel says there's something wrong oh, yeah. with you and Jesus fixes that and so if you're going to be offensive let the gospel do let the let the message of love and redemption be the part of that equation and you don't have to be offensive yeah. you can take the gospel to them also, so Summer Olympics, way overrated. You think so? Tell Top me why. Winter Olympics guy. Yeah, honestly. So I was going to ask you, what's your favorite? Um, assuming you're not one of the people boycotting the Olympics, what's your favorite event? Uh, no, I'm not one of the people boycotting the Olympics. Nor did I cancel Netflix. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> hey, I'm going to do with my money what I feel like I should. Other yeah. people do with their money what they feel like they should. Sure. And also quit sharing the meme that Netflix lost $4 billion right after that because it's not true. If you'll go to the pages that create this meme, you'll see in their biography where it says this is a parody page. This is a troll account. We're just trying to get you to share stuff without fact. I did not think you were going to take the low ring and lay low ring for that. Anyway, no, I'm not boycotting <laughs> the Olympics. Um, but I wasn't going to watch them anyway. So I'm sure it's <laughs> better. Boycotting by uh, uh, default. Um, do you have a favorite? summer event or is it only the olympic or the winter events i mean favorite summer event it's really cool to see some of the sprints like where these people are just moving like super fast yeah um, obviously with the rise of michael phelps and katie ledecky we all became big swim fans oh yeah we did uh but at the end of the day like no I yeah whatever it's fine yeah it's all right now give me all the bobsled the, or the the curling <laughs> Jamaican bobsled team, baby. Uh, we had the boys. I saw you guys take a picture sledding. in the prop bobsled from that, which is so it's cool getting to show the boys cool runnings and uh, watching the movie. And then we get to Jamaica and chasing my 10 year old goes, Dad, there it is. they really say, Yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's awesome. It was great. I think it's intriguing to me because so here's the, here's the subplot in the Olympics right now with basketball is basketball used to be a primar- primarily predominant. American sport and what you've seen in the NBA right now is that a lot of these high level basketball players are international stars now and they've come to the NBA uh, because of the paychecks and everything else but when you get to the Olympics you know at first it was 16 years ago and then it was 12 years ago and there was eight years ago and now it's four years ago and now it's today what you're seeing in the basketball field is everything's not nearly as lopsided as it used to be, and it's all pretty even, and it's fascinating to watch. So if you're interested, AJ, and you want to watch a cool uh, documentary, there's a documentary uh, on Netflix called The Redeem Team. Redeem Team, baby. Did you watch it? I haven't watched it, but I watched them. Yeah, and so it's just about that team, uh, basketball team, the Olympics, going back and redeeming American basketball. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's documentary, you know, professional athletes. There's some language there for sure, but uh, it, sure. it's a solid documentary. I'm going to check it out. That's good. All right, so let's let's move on to now that we've given everybody a hot takes let's move on to some <laughs> some spiritual thing well those were not those weren't unspiritual by any means but move on to some orchard specific things i guess i should say so yeah. you have the fall or er, coming up and, and i mean summer's winding down and usually summer's and, winding down but the temperature keeps going up baby brother does it ever um and so that means that fall things are coming and again just based on the church calendar the school calendar all that kind of stuff that means things are ramping up so what are some of those things that are winding up this fall that are coming down the the pipe Okay, so when you say winding up, you mean like gearing up. Yeah, I mean like... Not I, like winding... Summer's winding down, fall is gearing up. Yeah, but why can't we wind up like a pitcher winds up? I, I knew where you were going with that. I'm just, you know, not... I just want to be clear. Gear it up. I want to be gear it up. I want to be clear. What, what's, what's gearing up? Um, well, I think uh, the first thing that is right around the corner, it's uh, coming up on the 11th, which is a Sunday, is we're going to be having Next Steps lunch, first Next Steps lunch uh, of the fall at all of our locations. And um, I think that's a big deal 
Uh, we talk about it a lot. And if you've been coming to the orchard for a while, which I'm guessing most of you who are listening to this have, uh, you've heard us talk about next steps. Uh, but the truth is probably a lot of you haven't been to a next steps lunch. And we created the next steps lunch um, several, several years ago uh, for the purpose of making it simple for people to get connected. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, the point of our next steps lunches are not you're brand new and you want to meet us. I mean, that that's a big part of it, but that's not the main point of it. If you are new, yeah, sure, there, there's going to be a great place for you to go and meet people. Uh, but even if you've been coming for a while, the point of Next Steps Lunch is to make it easy for you to, get this, take your next step. Oh. You see what we did there? <laughs> oh, wow. That's marketing, Chris. That, yeah, that's marketing. That's um, so when you leave Next Steps Lunch, our goal is is that you know how to join a group, mm -hmm. you know where you can plug in to serve, or at least start looking at places you can plug in to serve, right. and you know how you can begin giving and become a member of the church, yeah. if you want. Those are all next steps. I want to join a group, I want to serve, I want to start giving, I want to become a member. Now, if you've been to a next steps lunch, and one of those things has been ambiguous, unclear, or not mentioned, please let us know so yeah, that we can sure. circle back and clarify, but yes. Yeah, so, that, so that's the point. And, um, you know, maybe you need to go to more than one Next Steps lunch. Maybe you went to a Next Steps lunch and you said, yeah, nah, church membership's not for me. That's fine. We don't push it hard. But you started giving and you've been coming for a year or so now. But you're like, you know what? I never did join a group or find a place to serve. Well, go back to Next Steps lunch mm -hmm. and talk about that. Yeah, that's what it's there for. And it's free lunch. It is. You know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, people don't like free lunches. There's a, like zero cons to going to Next Steps lunch. I don't know. I love free lunch. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Uh, we also, you have a chance to ask questions. There. Yeah, that and that's probably, honest to God, one of my favorite parts of Next Steps Lunch is the end where it's like, all right, now what do you guys want to know? If we haven't hit on it already, what do you want to know about us? What are some of those things that you've been like dying to ask us that you're skeptical about? Because I think sometimes we are strategically unintended, uh, un not unclear, but but we keep some things ambiguous we until talk you about, want to know. Well, yes, we... We want to talk about, on Sunday morning, in our worship time, things that matter most. Yeah. Jesus, the gospel, and stuff that is relevant to 75-plus percent of the room. Yeah. Right? If it only applies to 10 people in the room, we don't want to waste time on Sunday saying it, because we got 70 minutes on a Sunday morning. Right. We want to use them well. Um, so it's not that we're not transparent. Some people are always ask, and I'm sure you've had, why don't you guys talk about blank? Yeah. Don't have time. Yeah. That's one of the byproducts of being a church that has one minutes. service with 70 minutes during yeah. a week. Uh, we are happy to answer whatever question we can, whenever. But this is the perfect time to ask. You don't have to pull somebody aside. You can show up, talk about it, may jog a question in somebody else's mind. It's good stuff. Yeah, it's good. So you got Next Steps Lunch coming. I think that's incredibly valuable. Uh, if you want to go to one of those, um, your your location probably has it on their flow code. Do that. Or the next Sunday when you get to your location, grab one of those Connect cards, fill it out, and drop it in the box, and say, hey, I'm planning to attend Next Steps Lunch so that your location pastor knows how much food to prepare for, and they can reach out and start to get a head count and, yeah. and prepare for you to be there. So, uh, Deucer, uh, Chris, can you drop a link in the show notes uh, that people can sign up for that? He's probably already done it. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah, he already did. He's not in set. He's already What done. a guy. What a day. Yeah. Should have known. That's awesome. Um, so, next thing is, that's a Sunday. Mm -hmm. The following Wednesday, student ministry ramps back up. It will. Yep. All of our locations, Lake City, Live Oak, Branford, we have student ministry at all locations now, have uh, first semester, and it's going to be gearing back up. And uh, it's going to be a good time, especially for uh, incoming sixth graders yeah. who are like moving <laughs> up and they're stepping into the jungle for the first time. And they're like, oh gosh, there's there's 11th graders and 12th graders over yeah. there. And yeah. look, I like, I like that voice. It's, <laughs> it's a thing. It, it, it's a thing, man. Like it is uh, one of the things that is hard about student ministry in a small community is having to have high schoolers and middle schoolers together because mm. that's a big age gra age gap between sixth graders and 12th graders. However, once they come to student ministry, they don't have to stay in that big group. We do break them down yeah. to small groups, middle school, small groups, boys and girls, high school, small groups, boys and girls. Yep. Um, so anyway, student ministry is gearing back up. Uh, definitely, if you haven't uh, plugged into that, but you are a student, have a student, um, you got to get plugged in. It's worth it. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the breakdown too because I think it's good for parents to know, and, and Matt alluded to this again last week, but we, we want to be a Home Depot church. We, you can do it. We can help. And one of the ways that we like to help with that in student ministry is breaking down into small groups. For us, it's gender-specific, age-specific, and so 
they're going to have a small group leader in there. And that small group leader functions as a second voice in your kid's life because you as a dad, me as a dad, we know that when we can tell our kids something and sometimes the light bulb just ain't going to go off or they're not going to listen until somebody else tells them. And so that's the we can help part. We have a small group leader in every age group that's designed to be able to speak into your student biblical truths and come alongside you and be able to say, yeah, what they're saying is true, it's right, and hopefully um, you're saying the same things as far as biblical truths go so that they can say it's true and it's right, you know, so it's it's good. That's good. So Sunday, the 11th, Next Steps Lunch, 14th, Wednesday night student ministry starts back. The 18th, which is the next Sunday, is our first fall night of worship, and we're looking forward to it. We've been talking about it on Sundays for a little bit now, so this probably isn't the first time you've heard of it, uh, but man— we love nights of worship at the orchard. That's why we committed to doing them more regularly. Uh, and part of that is because that is where we are celebrating the Lord's Supper as a church this year. Um, not saying that's going to be the only time we do the Lord's Supper going forward, but for this year specifically, we wanted to build all of our nights of worship around that concept of coming together as one church in one place to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Yeah, And uh, it's going to be no different this time around. Um, I think Lucas, uh, who is our live worship leader, who's done a good job of kind of heading these up this year, um, has done a good job of kind of keeping them fresh. So it's not the same yeah. thing every time. That's right. But uh, I just I know from talking to him and we've got a meeting coming up about this. Um, man, it's going to be it's going to be good that this one's going to be good. You want to come. Um, doors are going to open about 30 minutes before it starts. The doors open about 530, start at six, get you a seat. Uh, bring a friend. This is a great front door to the orchard for, mm-hmm. for people who've never been before. And uh, I promise you, I don't think I've ever had somebody say, ah, you know what? I, I really wish I hadn't have come. But I'm like, worse, it's just worse for going to that. Such a waste of time. You know, yeah. No, everybody usually loves loves having had made that decision. And it's honestly like it's powerful, I think. And I said this Sunday, it's powerful to be in a room with that many believers exalting Jesus at the same time taking the Lord's Supper together. I, I really do love it. It's one, It's a sweet time together. It truly is. So mark your calendar, be there, make that happen. And then what else? Is there anything else that I'm missing here, Chip? Well, one thing that um, we have not next month, but coming up down the line is we have a special event coming in September. Not going to say much about it right now, but we are getting close to the official launch. Yeah. And I will just say this, go ahead and black out the date. September 8th, Sunday, September 8th. Go ahead, say just go ahead and hold it. Black out the whole month of September so you don't miss it. Just September 8th. I'm going to give you a little bit more info, not revealing what we're doing that day, but just saying you don't want to miss what it. What is the 8th? What is that day? Sunday. A Sunday. Beautiful. Yeah, I love it. Sunday. I'm excited. It's going to be good. It is going to be good. So. Um, but uh, ahead of all that and ahead of everything we just talked about is we are starting a brand new sermon series. Love it. This coming Sunday. Um, it's going to be kind of a throwback slash sequel to one of uh, AJ. I think one of your favorite series. It is did. one of my favorite series. Uh, one of our one of our series we did a while back was called Questions from Jesus, mm. where we just looked in the New Testament, the Gospels, at questions that Jesus asked individuals and yeah. what the point was behind that. Well, this series we're starting this Sunday is going to be questions. No, four. Jesus. I thought it was answers from Jesus. That's what I said. Answers yeah. for Jesus. I got I got backwards in my head for just a minute. Answers for Jesus. Answers from Jesus. Answers from Jesus. Jesus, I got something I need you to know, brother. Well, that does happen often <laughs> in the comedy <laughs> web. Uh, you ever had that moment where you turn 40 and your brain just stops working? <laughs> that's good. Hey, this is why it's a shameless plug for team. Team matters. Look, that's why we do team. I would love to tell people that I was trying to pull it out of thin air, but it's literally written right there in the show doc. Yeah, <laughs> it's 100% right there. That's good. But either way, it's going to be good. from Jesus. Yeah, same, Jesus. Same approach. We're going through the Gospels. We're going to look at where people ask Jesus questions. Yeah. And then look at how Jesus answered them. I love it. It's going to be good. I, I'm excited about it. I love any time we get to look at the way Jesus postures himself, the way he responds, the way he carries himself. I always... That always intrigues me because we are little Christ, right? Christians, we want to follow in his footsteps and figure out, okay, if this is what Jesus looks like when he navigates turmoil, how do I do it? If this is what Jesus looks like when he navigates sinful people, how do I do it? So I'm excited to see the series unfold. So you know what's really interesting, though, uh, in kind of preparing for the series? Jesus was asked, well, let's start with this. Jesus asked just over 300 questions Mm -hmm. in the gospel. Yeah. He was asked just over 180 questions in the gospel. 
He gave a clear, direct, straightforward answer three times. Mm. All right, so listen, that math, based on that math, it is not only okay to answer a question with a question, it's okay to answer a question with two questions because that's really what happens. And so I'm excited to see... It's kind of crazy, huh? Yeah, that, that's going to be really cool to unpack. I'm excited about that series, all to say. So that's good. That's what's coming up in the fall. So I think the, the last thing I would I would ask you to, to hit on mention is groups and why groups are so important, why they're so Yeah, cool. so this is one of the things that we're not like hard and fast on a semester model of groups at the orchard like uh some groups meet year round or on their own schedule most of our groups uh, operate on more of a semester model where they'll take a break over the holidays and a break over the summer Mm -hmm. um and then they'll start meeting back up so most of our groups are getting ready to like kick back off um here in the next few weeks groups are important at the orchard because you can only accomplish so much sitting in rows Mm -hmm. There has to be a time where we come together to sit in circles. And I think that the the cliche line over the years has been that groups are the primary vehicle for spiritual formation. Like this is where spiritual formation happens. And I'm not saying it's not true, but I also don't want to downplay the spiritual formation that happens when you show up Sunday after Sunday Mm. under the teaching of the word, under worship. But what I will say is that will only get you so far. Yeah. Whether you are in a group, quote unquote, or not, you need to be in a relationship with other believers that is not just a friendship, but a relationship that's centered around spiritual formation. That's right. And groups are the organizational way that we do that. Yeah. Right? Because we have some people who have this that are not in a, quote, small group yeah. at the orchard. Sure. Right? They're just in relationship with others. Um, for instance, our, our pastors, we, we do this in our sermon prep meeting, mm. uh, you know, every week to yeah. a big extent. Uh, but groups are a simple, straightforward way that anybody who attends the orchard can get plugged in to relationship with others who attend the orchard and some who don't for the purpose of furthering their spiritual formation. And to me, what I like to say is that our small groups are not Bible studies, but they study the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. I think a differentiation in my mind about that is that Bible studies are there so that you can gain knowledge. And I guess the end goal being win Bible trivia competitions. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, sword drills. Right. But our, our small groups are more not about the information, but the transformation. And that is, yes, we study the Bible, but not for an end unto itself. We study the Bible because we want to know how to live. Yeah. Look, how do we yeah. live this out? What does this look like at my job on Monday afternoon? What does this look like at a Tuesday night ball field? What does this look like when I'm hanging out with my buddies on Saturday? Like, how does all of that shape form who I am and who I'm becoming? That's the point of these groups, that we take our spiritual formation to the next level inside of community. Yeah, love it. Love it. So get in a group. It's shameless plug. You'll be better for it. It'll, I think, have a serious impact on your spiritual formation because you're going to see the value in that. So it's good. I love it. Good word. Um, I'm curious though, so that's kind of everything that's coming in the fall. Fall is always busy because not only is student ministry starting back, but we need to have a student ministry training. It's not only a group starting back, we have group leader training. So all this stuff really, that's one of it. Which is maybe another and, point to plug. Hey, this is also a great time to get plugged in serving. Yeah. With, I, with everything kicking back off, it's a great time if you want to find a place to serve at the church. Let me just say, you don't have to serve inside the four walls of the church on the nights that we have events as a church. Mm-hmm. You can serve outside the church as long as you're following Jesus yeah. and doing that on purpose. However, it's very easy to begin a lifestyle of serving others and serving Jesus by plugging into existing ministries that we have. And this is a great time to do that. Absolutely. So excited for the fall. It'll be good. Plug in to serve, get in a group, come to these events. We have them because we think there's a ton of value in them. But I'm curious, Chip, to see at, from the lead seat as the guy who's who's watching all these things unfold at all these locations and, and spearheading a lot of it, what do you want to see us accomplish at the orchard this fall? You know, that's a good question. It's a hard question because I think a lot of times we overestimate what we can accomplish in the next three months, six months, year, but then we may underestimate what we can accomplish in the next five years or the next 10 years, Mm -hmm. right? I think part of that's just the society that we live in. And so when I look at the fall, right, let's just say, we're going to say, you know, I know this isn't technically the quote fall, but in church world, what we're really talking about is August, September, October, 
and the first part of November, because after that, we really start getting into the holidays and things get different again. But there's a chunk there between August, September, October, first part of November, where we really have a lot of, for the most part, uninterrupted calendar time to really drill down on the way I like to talk about it is moving the ball down the field yeah. at the orchard. That's right. And so I think what I want to see happen is probably not something that's going to be fully accomplished in that time period. But what I'd like to see is us really begin to gear up for our next season as a church. So, all right, our next season as a yeah. church, what is that? Hey, what does that mean? Would like churches have seasons? What do you mean? Well, what I don't mean is, okay, we're in the fall gearing up for the winter. Right. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't necessarily mean it like that. <laughs> That's good. Get the storehouses uh, ready, baby. Maybe, maybe I mean season of life. Right. So, so what do you think or what do you hope? is the next season for our church. So, you know... If I can ask When you look at churches, I think that there are, like, definitely different life cycles in a church. There's people who are a lot smarter than I am who've wrote about life cycles of the organization or they've written about life cycles in the church specifically. Um, But even without their terminology and data, if you just look at a church, right, when a church is planted, you know, it's that infant, right? You know, and, and we know... Uh, from facts that a lot of church plants don't succeed. Actually, only about half of church plants still exist five years after their plant. Okay, I was going to ask, when's that cutoff number? You said five years. It kind of varies, and to be honest, I'm not up to date on the latest numbers, but the latest numbers that I am aware of, it was like, okay, half a church plant still exists five years after they're planted. Okay. Um, And then after they're planted, there's really that kind of childhood stage where they're beginning to shape their identity, who they are, what they want to accomplish. Some of that is like those awkward teenage years where you'll have people leave the church that they help plan because, well, this isn't the same church I helped plan. It's not because we're in our awkward teenage years and we're yeah. having a kind of transition. And And I think when I look at the orchard, we're turning 18 this year. And so we're becoming, I would say, an adult. And so I think in this fall, I would like to see us prepare for that next season in the life of our church, really where we're going to move into our young adult years. In a lot of ways, the orchard still feels like a church plant, right? Like we're still new. There's not a lot of traditions. There's still a whole lot that's malleable and flexible. But the truth is, we've been around for 18 years now. Yeah. Like that's, that's when is our, eight, when's the 18 year mark? Uh, so saying? we celebrated on the harvest celebration, but the actual launch of the church um, is in spring, summer. I don't remember the date off the top of my head. Yeah. So I was curious. So, so that's where, you know, we're at uh, as a church. And I kind of feel like, all right, the question about whether the orchard's going to survive. That, that's been answered. Right. We're here. Yeah. And we're going to be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have, in a lot of ways, transitioned through a lot of our awkward teenage years. We, 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 don't, we, just, we know more than just that we're here. We know the kind of church that we want to be and the kind of church that we're going to be. Mm-hmm. Right? We're going to be a church that impacts lostness. That's right. We're going to be a multi-site church. We're going to be an outward-focused church. We're going to be an attractional church church, you know, and uh, people may think that's a dirty word. I'd say if you have cushioned seats and, you know, air conditioning, then <laughs> you're a attractional church as well. Um, Some people aren't ready for that conversation. They're not. You're right. They're not. Uh, but the, the point is, is in the early days of the church, we had to spend as much time, and I say we really primarily, you know, Eddie and Michael had to spend a bunch of their time defining who we worked, mm-hmm. right? Hey, yeah. we're not going to be, we're not going to have uh, Sunday night services. We're not going to have a choir. We're not going to be putting in an organ. We're not, gonna, you know, and then we've kind of transitioned through the phase. Okay. Not just who we're not. This, this is who we are. This is who we're going to be. We're not just negatively, not these things that we don't like about other churches. We are these things that we feel called to. Mm-hmm. And so now we answered, are we going to be here? We've answered who we are and what we're going to be. And now I think it's time for us to start preparing for the future. What is, and maybe the succession over the last couple of years between Eddie and myself as the lead pastor has kind of put this question in my mind, what is the legacy of the orchard going to be? Yeah. And I don't know that we can write that fully, the end, stamp it, done, but what is, what legacy are we preparing for at the orchard? Like, you know, if something happens and, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we have to shut the doors down because of blank. I don't know what that would be. What's the legacy that we're going to leave behind? 
what does it look like for us not to just be a church on the fringes, but a church that takes leadership in our communities, a church that has a presence and an impact and an influence, in my mind, on a regional level here in North Central Florida? How do we begin to really step into that young adulthood and begin to shape the legacy of who we are, I love we're known for? I love the analogy because young adults are given responsibility. Young adults are given not just responsibility for them, but the people around them, right? The other churches and how we influence them and how we value them and how we give input and we make sure they find value in us. And so I love that analogy and I'm excited to see, I don't know how much of that you uh, would get into or want to get into. We don't have to get into any of it, but I'm excited to yeah, see. We'll, we'll save some of that for the fall you know, yeah. coming yeah. up. But, you know, I think that that is where my mind is. Yeah. Not that we're going to get there. Maybe there's not even a there to get right now, but I want to see us start moving that way. Yeah, and I think, so Here, here's what I would add to that, and, and I'm not in your seat, but here's what I understand about how churches work from your seat, that you're not going to be the guy that does this. Like You're not going to be the guy that does this on your own, I should say. It, it's going to be people at the local church buying into the mission and vision and the stage of life in that local church that's going to add the value, that's going to be able to have the impact. And so you can be the champion for that, and you can make a lot of the hard decisions along the way. But if people don't buy in, if staff doesn't buy in to being the local church, to our community, to our city, then we're going to struggle in young adulthood. And so it's going to be a reflection of leadership, yes, but it's also going to be buy-in from the people. We need our people to take ownership of, man, this is my church, and I want to see my church do incredible things and impact lostness and, and run the race with us. Yeah, so. I think that's that's spot on. I think that over the last couple of years, maybe the first steps toward that has been our churches rallying around the idea of impacting lostness mm. and a holistic spiritual formation. Yeah. Like, I think those are like, just seeing the energy and buy-in around those two things, um, I think are our first steps toward, okay, that, that's who we're going to be. That's what our adulthood is going to look like. We're going to be a church that impacts lostness. We're going to be a church that focuses on holistic spiritual formation. Yeah. Loving God and loving people. Yeah. Right? And uh, and so I'm excited to see as that matures what it becomes and the impact it has. Yeah. It's cool. I love it. I love it. I'm excited to see what that looks like too. Is there, so we're kind of rounding this thing out and I love this, just like the, not randomness, but culturally pointedness of this conversation today. Is there anything you would add to the end of it as we kind of round this out? I mean, I, I just can't get away from... The idea of a world that is so shaped by social media mm. that it is so easy and quick to share these memes or other posts or other opinions. And, and I think that maybe as believers, we ought to be very careful what we are known for, mm. especially on social media. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the people that you're with on social media, they don't know you in real life or they know you loosely in real life. Their opinion of you is largely shaped by what they see on social media. We were having a, this same conversation in a group chat the other day. Somebody had asked this. They were like, do you guys think it's weird that people you've never talked to in person and may never talk to you, like send you friend requests? Like that, she just said, that seems incredibly weird to me. Like, I don't know you. I don't particularly care to know you, I guess, if you're not going to be in my life. And so why would you like yeah. come into my living room on social media kind of thing? But yeah, I agree completely. And so I think that social media account is, is a digital, is, is a presence in a digital world. And I would say, what are you known for mm -hmm. by those who don't know you well? Yeah. What are you known for by those who don't know you well? Primarily social media. So take time, scroll through your Instagram, scroll through your Facebook and ask, if I didn't know me, what would I think of me? Yeah. What would I think is important to me? Family, mm -hmm. sports, yeah, politics, mm -hmm. or Jesus? If I didn't know me well, what would I think about what I think about others based on what I see on my social media? Because at the end of the day, what I want to be known for is somebody who loves Jesus and loves people. And I can love people who don't look like me, who don't act like me, who don't vote like me, who don't believe like me. But I can also love Jesus and take a stand on some things. And it's okay to have opinion on things. That That's part of who you are and what makes you you. But ask, what am I known for? Yeah. And I think if you're watching this or listening to this, um, man, I would seriously, like, not like, oh, wow, what a challenge. No, like, seriously, like, after we're done with this podcast, if you're in your car, as soon as you hit park, if you're at the office, as soon as you're done, whatever, take two minutes 
and just scroll through your social media feed yeah. and then ask, if I didn't know me well, what would I think about me? It's good. I like I think it. The answer is maybe not what we would like. Yeah. A lot of the times. It's, it's gonna anyway, be just, yeah. just a thought. Yeah. Some of y'all can be like, oh, I only vacation <laughs> and, and I only I, get a highlight reel. My life's awesome. That's right. That's oh, right. man. No, that's good. I love it. That's awesome. Man, well, I'm glad you're back, Chip. I, I have too. enjoyed just sitting with you, you this morning. And so I'm glad you're back. I miss the office. Yeah. I miss my Batman coffee cup. Yeah. Getting some coffee, turning on some tunes. Yeah, tunes. That's crazy. All right. Well, I am excited <laughs> to get back with you guys next week. Excited for the fall to launch. But that's all we have for today. We will catch you guys next week. See ya. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk About That. We hope it encouraged and challenged you as we continue to grow in this journey of faith and embrace community. If you have more questions, thoughts, or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us through our social media channels or visit our website and stay connected. Your questions are what make this podcast a dynamic and enriching experience. If you found today's discussion meaningful, don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave a review. Your engagement helps us spread the message and connect with others who may find value in these conversations. Until next time, we hope this episode inspired you and will help you bring Sunday's message into your week ahead. Keep the conversation alive, and remember, we're all on this journey together.